and said, we want power. We want power to determine the destiny of our own community. We wanted decent housing. We wanted to determine the destiny of our community. Decent education taught us about our true history. Uh, we wanted fair treatment in the courts, duties of our peers. We wanted to end to police brutality. We wanted a relevant education that taught us who we were and our role in society. These are the hard facts. The directors are playing with time. By producing a disaster, they will almost slow down time. Harming everything and everybody on this earth with the bomb, the bomb, the bomb, the bomb, and everybody will be equal after the bomb. Ready or not, sounds will be quadruplanic in more directions than one can see. Who's and ours will be all awesome. gotta rise up. Tomorrow be now, now, we now, gotta now, organize. And everybody will be equal after We've the bomb. We gotta mobilize. East will go west, north will go south. The rats and the roaches will dig deeply for cover, providing and proving how they can and will survive, 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 survive. And everybody will be equal after the bomb. These are the hard facts. The suburbs will go to the slums, the slums will go to the ghetto. Downtown, in town, cross town, and uptown will go to the moon, to the moon, mushroom style. And everybody will be equal after the bomb, after the bomb, after the bomb, after the bomb. After the bomb, after the bomb, after the bomb, after the bomb, after the bomb. When anybody preaches disunity, tries to pit one of us against the other through class warfare, race hatred, or religious intolerance, you know that person seeks to rob us of our freedom and destroy our very lives. The American dream for most ethnic groups was the dream of a lifetime. Many people moved into tight-knit communities, brought homes, sent their children off to school, had elaborate affairs, and established a powerful economic base of income. But the one group that struggled with this so-called American dream was the black population. At the beginning of 1940, the Great Depression had ended. Black Americans had suffered when the United States entered into World War II, the private sector recalibrated the industrial mass production plants to produce the equipment and necessary material for war. The acute industrial labor shortage resulted in a mass migration of blacks from the south to the north factories and jobs. The military saw black Americans enlisted in record numbers to participate in the fight for freedom. However, the segregation of blacks and white soldiers in the military caused many, many problems. Blacks were forced in the early 1940s to live in overcrowded, dilapidated houses, and as a result of this increased presence, we started to create jobs for ourselves. We began building a foundation for economic power. Most white residents and their businesses moved out of the community. So we opened our own barber shops, our own beauty shops, our restaurant, doctor offices, funeral home, grocery stores, and other small businesses and prospered. Blacks felt comfortable and safe in their own communities as they struggled with this economic power and ownership in the broader American society. And once the war ended, the black population had doubled in northern communities containing a variety of ethnic groups. Their presence could not be ignored. Blacks looking for housing had to deal with redlining and redistricting and restrictive covenants and these tools of power structure forced black Americans to live only in metropolitan areas called ghettos. These Jim Crow laws and real estate isolated and discriminated against blacks not only in housing, mortgage loans, but in development of economic wealth. In the 1940s and late 40s, Jackie Robinson was the first American to sign with a major league team. President Harriet Truman signed a bill segregating the armed forces and interracial marriages were banned in California. Blacks all across America were subjected to low-wage inferior schools and segregation. How could we have fought, bled, and died World War I, II, and later the Korean War and be rejected by the America that viewed us as the underdogs of the world? While the Allied forces were victorious in world wars, Black American soldiers were not celebrated as they faced racial tension and housing discrimination when they came home looking for good jobs. The economy had contracted. The competition for industrial jobs was fierce. 
businesses closed, white immigrants could drop their last name and accent to adapt to a change in the economy. Blacks could not change. The color of their skin and, and melting, melting pot, well, you know. The end of the World War II produced an important progeny in the civil rights movement. The double V campaign, victory abroad, but not victory at home. And in most African American communities, groups were being formed by young educated youth guided by elders to fight segregation and Jim Crow. They were boycotting segregation policies of white businesses, factories, clubs that would not hire, serve, or accommodate blacks. Buses were boycotted. For their segregation, their segregated seating arrangement started a nonviolent demonstration. Hello. I came right over. Well, I was certainly glad to hear from you people today. Life can really be so much simpler than people let it be most of the time. Well, now, uh, with whom do I negotiate? Are you Mrs. Younger? Or your son, then? Just some official papers, Sonny. Travis, honey, you go on downstairs now, baby. No. No, you don't, Travis. You stay right here. And you make him understand what you're doing, Walter Lee. You teach him good, like Willie Harris taught you. And you show him where our five generations done come to, son. Go ahead. Go ahead. you, uh, me and my family. Because we are plain people, you know. We are plain people. Yes? I work as a chauffeur, you know. Most of my life. And my wife works in people's kitchens. And so does my mother. I mean, we are plain people. Well, Mr. Younger, my you... father, my father was a laborer all of his life. Yes. And my father once, my father once almost beat a man to death because this man, he called him some kind of name, you know. That's my sister. And she is going to be a doctor. And we are very proud. Well, I'm see, sure. here, see, we, we come from a long line of proud people. He makes the sixth generation, the sixth generation of my family in this country. And we have, we have all thought about your offer. And we've decided to move into our house because my father, he earned it 
brick by brick. Now we don't intend to cause no trouble or fight no causes and we're going to try to be good neighbors. That's all. That's all we can say. We don't want your money. I take it then you've decided to occupy. That's what the man said. Well, then I appeal to you, Mrs. Younger. You're older and wiser. I'm afraid you don't understand. My son said we was gonna move. And there ain't nothing left for me to say. You know these young folks nowadays, mister, you can't hardly do a thing with them. Goodbye. Well, if you don't find about it, there's nothing left for me to say. I sure hope you people know what you're doing. Point one said we want power. We want power to determine the destiny of our own community. We wanted the end to police brutality. Uh, we want a fair treatment in the courts and juries of our peers. These are the hard facts. These are the hard facts. Point one said we want power. We want power to determine the destiny of our own community. These are the hard facts. We wanted to determine the destiny of our community. These are the hard facts. Decent education to tell us about our true history. We've got to rise up. We've got to organize. We've got to mobilize. These are the hard facts. These are the hard facts. We wanted to determine the destiny of our community. Uh, we wanted fair treatment in the courts and juries of our peers. We wanted the end to police brutality. We've got to rise up. We've got to organize. We've got to mobilize. Well, I first read a small article in the newspaper that the first colored family had moved into this community. And um, following that, why I began to hear on the radio and read in the newspaper that there was some disturbance around this home that these uh, people had brought. What was your initial reaction? I was terribly shocked to find that there were people in this community who would be so violently opposed to it. I rather thought that everyone would just accept it as I would. Was the community prepared in any way for the entrance of the first Negro family into Old White Lavitt Town? Well, there was an attempt by uh, a group of ministers who formed a group called the Human Relations Council, and they were just getting started on their work. I don't know how they expected to ultimately accomplish the purpose of educating everyone, but I know that they had a, an open forum one time, and uh, just within the last three or four months, and the results of it were published in the paper. Do you feel it was effective? <laughs> no, I'm afraid it was just a drop in the bucket. And, uh, not very many people even read or were aware of the article or of the meeting that preceded it. Although there had been little interest in the formation of the Human Relations Council some weeks before, the Myers became the main topic of conversation for the people of Levittown within a few hours of their arrival. In the absence of fact and authoritative information on a situation like this, rumor and gossip sweep through the community. As the stories pass from one person to another, because hardly anybody knows the truth, what everybody is saying becomes the fact. Oh, I heard lots of rumors. I was busy <laughs> telling people not to believe them. What kind? Well, that they had been sponsored chiefly. I think people resented 
after they heard this rumor and believed it, they resented feeling that uh, some outside group had deliberately moved these people in, that they were sponsored and paid by an outside group to do this very thing. And uh, I had been told on good authority that that wasn't true at all, and uh, so I told people that it wasn't true. Do you feel that understanding the facts of the situation will help? Oh, yes, I do. I'm sure that uh, a more reasonable attitude is going to prevail in this community, and I I'm, have great faith in the people here, and that they'll, uh, they'll soon find out there's nothing to be afraid of. Some view the incident calmly and indicate acceptance of the fact. But for others, the Myers moving into Levittown constitutes an infringement of their own liberties. And under the impact of this situation, they react with anger and force. What they say reveals their deepest fears and frustrations. Why did you select Levittown to live? We were looking for a place to buy a home. We looked at Levittown, and we liked the homes here. We liked the advantages that Levittown seemed to offer in uh, comparison to other cities. And we understood that it was going to be all white, and we were very happy to buy a home here. How about your children? Have you talked with them about the Myers? We have tried to keep uh, the discussions away from the children. Uh, I, figure, I, I feel that it's something that uh, we adults should solve without bringing the children into it any more than we have to. We're doing it for the children, but I don't feel that they are old enough to understand the problem as it is. Do you think a Negro family moving here will affect the community as a whole? Definitely. In what way? I think that, well, the property values will immediately go down if uh, they are allowed to move in here in any number. Can you give a basis for that judgment? Yes, we used to live in Washington, D.C., and we saw a very good example of that there. The repetition of an experience that was distasteful. Is there to be no escape from living near Negroes? And what of the dream of middle-class respectability? If a Negro family can afford what you can afford, how do you justify your feeling of superiority? The illogic of one's own position becomes apparent, and in self-justification, the old tribal myths are invoked. What other objections, aside from the effect on property values, do you have against the Myers? The whole thing centers around the word integration. Well, as Mr. Myers said, because his home has been anything but peaceful since he moved in. He's got three children, and uh, evidently he feels that they will be accepted socially. And uh, I don't feel that they ever will be. But the whole trouble with this integration business is that uh, in the end, it probably will end up with, with mixing socially. And you will have, well, I think their aim is mixed marriages and becoming equal with the whites. But the only way they're going to do that is by education and by bettering themselves, not by pushing in the way they have here. Do you intend to move? At the time, no. It's a pretty impossible situation. We have... Uh, we have our home here, and if the colored move in and run real estate values down, there are a lot of us, the GIs particularly, who are going to be more or less stuck with their homes. As the lines are drawn, those on either side become more adamant. Tension develops and feeds on suspicion and mistrust. What has been the effect of the Myers coming here? Well, it's, it's created a great deal of tension, not uh, among the neighbors, because we all feel the same. But uh, it's naturally made everyone tense in their home. I mean, this, this is affecting our homes. And uh, it's bound to create tension. It's the subject that's talked about all the time. But there are others who are for the Myers? Yes, I've read about them. For what reason, do you think, do they support the Myers? Frankly, I don't know what reasons they can have for it. If there are homeowners in Levittown, I don't see what reasons they can have for it. Do you think Myers will be able to live here comfortably? Comfortably? No. What course of action are you going to follow? I'll do what I can uh, to help, to, 
to get them out legally and peacefully. And as far as accepting them socially, if that's what you mean, I could never do that. To take sides in such a situation is more than a matter of one's own conscience. What a man believes becomes a subject for community debate. For those who believe a man has a right to live anywhere he wishes, the answers are simple and straightforward. Has this affected your relationship with neighbors? No, we've discussed it freely. We found people for and against, but we've tried to keep, uh, keep it being discussed. That was the important thing. Have you heard any rumors? Many, many. I won't repeat them because I don't like to repeat rumors, and I don't think it's fair to keep them alive. Do you think rumors contributed to the reaction of those opposing the Myers? Uh, surely they did, but uh, we had some very interested citizens here who uh, pledged themselves to a fact-finding group, and they tried to dissolve those rumors as quickly as they were started by facts. Do you think the Myers will be able to live comfortably in Levittown? I think so. I hope so. I think the majority of people here will uh, grow accustomed to it and uh, realize that, oh, they, are, they can be good neighbors, which I'm sure they are. And uh, I think the majority of people here are not vi the violent, um, well, violent group that we have heard so much about. Do you think the Myers staying in Levittown will affect property values? Uh, I don't think that the Myers have anything to do with the um, property decreasing or increasing. I think it's purely a white problem, not a Negro problem. In what way? I think it is the feeling of uh, the majority group which will influence the property, not the minority group. Those who want an integrated community take their stand based on their own deep feelings of what a community should be. Do you feel that the Myers will lead to large numbers of other Negroes coming here? No, I don't think so. I think that um, there will be a, probably a normal um, entrance and uh, not a deluge. I mean, people who, who want these homes will come here. It's not um, what people say that, um, oh, in flux. There won't be any such thing. There'll be a normal, I, I hope. I hope, and because uh, I would like to see an integrated group here, and I would like to see, uh, well, my child, and I hope my children go to uh, and live in a group that is representative of the world, and uh, not being an integrated group, it is, it is not now a representative of society. Um, of course, we've all discussed this, and we've all said that the um, answer to the problem is eventually when you find that there are no more areas to which a white person can move without uh, having a Negro family in. Well, that would be the, the best uh, end that there could be to uh, segregation. And it is probably um, something that will happen in the future, perhaps in the near future. For some, the answer is tremendously complicated, tied up in a maze of past associations and present influences. Sometimes opinions are expressed with grave misgivings and a sense of guilt. The past slips through despite what is said. Being for Myers can be difficult if one's background rejects this decision. Some of the people are definitely against integration. And they have told my children that they have to marry niggers. And my child doesn't even know what a nigger is, but from the sound, it has scared them, and they have come home just crying. <clears throat> Mommy, do I have to marry niggers? And my answer in handling all the fears that children come in is that you can marry who, whomever you wish. By the way, we both seem to be from below the Mason and Dixon line. Where are you from? I come from Kentucky. Had you known any Negroes before you came to Levittown? Um, my father <clears throat> had a business in an area where there were several colored people. 
And I can honestly say my, one of my best friends was a colored girl. And as children have no prejudice, we became very close friends. And in her later years, she has become a registered nurse and trying very hard to ha raise her children in a clean atmosphere. And we have talked now since we both have been married, and it's such a disadvantage to see her children try to grow up healthy in the atmosphere that they have to live in. A personal relationship and sympathy with a Negro who is trying to improve her circumstances seems to make a difference. I uh, have found uh, several colored people that I have enjoyed their friendship. Uh, I would not let that determine whether I become friend to them by the color uh, of their skin. Have you heard any rumors? <coughs> uh, I had heard several rumors of which that I have just taken as rumors go, but the one that bothered me most was the fact that the Myers family has moved in to several all-white sections and trying to be the first colored family to move in to start the other ones to come in that they have done this before now i believe that if they do come here to cause trouble then i'm against what they're doing their principal but if they're just trying to find a better place to live and to bring up their children then i'm for them there are those who live in levittown who like it and intend to stay. They have no intention of according the same privilege to the Myers. Some of them find it more comfortable to talk in a group. You're aware that a Negro family has moved into Levittown? Yes, I heard about it. What was your reaction? Dynamite. <laughs> Dynamite. <laughs> what have you done about it? Well, uh, I guess we just discussed it. How do you feel about the Myers moving in? Well, I'm very definitely against it. Before coming to Levittown, did you have any contact with Negroes? Well, I came from a small town where we didn't have any colored people. And at that time, I had, uh, well, I had no feelings either way. But while we were waiting for our house to be built, we lived in Trenton for nine months. And, uh, well, that was my first contact with them both in work and going through colored sections to work. And I was very happy I was moving into an all-white community. Have you ever discussed the Myers at home with your children? Never before in our house was anything mentioned, pro or con, about colored people. Because I feel that they have to uh, be in contact with them to a certain extent, and why should their minds be prejudiced? But since they have moved here, uh, they have heard remarks, and, uh, well, I'm afraid that they are going to dislike the idea. They, they were, uh, there were colored children in the school my son attended last year for the first time, and he often came home and said there had been trouble between them during the day at school. It becomes convenient to exaggerate one's own fears and to help a neighbor increase hers. My boy, uh, he likes sports, and he used to go down there every Saturday with a few of the boys from the neighborhood. And uh, there was an argument that occurred, something real silly. My boy and a colored boy got in an argument. Well, from that time on, for the whole remainder of the summer, the boy was afraid to get down there because the colored boys got a gang together. And every time they would get near my Jimmy, they would beat the devil out of me. I went to the principal and everything about it. A major factor is fear. Fear of economic loss, loss of status, fear of violence, and fear of intermarriage. Do you think other Negro families will come to Levittown? Definitely. Yes. What do you think will happen? Well, uh, just what's happening already. I don't know. It's a rumor I read in the paper where they have two colored uh, school teachers now in Levittown. So that's just a good example of what is going to happen. Well, what's wrong with that? I do not like I, I have uh, two daughters and two sons. And if there's too many colored people around here, I definitely will get out. I'm not thinking much. Well, I don't want her associating with colored people, period.
Well, I'm very definitely against mixed marriages, and that's eventually what it's going to come to. If children are raised together, they're not going to think of anything of marrying together. Well, I just could not live beside them. I don't feel that they should be oppressed. But I moved here. One of the main reasons was because it was a white community. And that's the only place I intend to live. If I have to leave Levittown, I will do so. For some Levittowners, the basic issues involved had nothing to do with intermarriage or property values, loss of status, fear of crime, neighborhood decline, or of being in the minority. They saw it as a test of democracy. What was your reaction to the Myers moving in? Well, I was happy to see this become more of an American community. There seems to be a large group opposed to the Myers. What would be your attitude toward them? Well, I would divide... I don't know if there are large groups of people opposed to the Myers. After all, we have some... I don't know, I guess close to 60,000 people in Levittown. Those mobs were never more than five or 600. And I think if you'd gone down to the shopping center any night at the time the mobs were here, you would have seen 10,000 people at the shopping center while the, those who were violently opposed to Myers moving in were engaging in what they were engaging in. You don't think then that a large majority is against Myers moving in? Well, that's not true offhand. I know some of the immediate neighbors right here who uh, were for the Myers moving in. I wouldn't hazard a guess of what the proportion is that welcomes the Myers and, how, and what proportion is opposed to it, but I don't think that's the main issue involved in this case anyway. What is the main issue? The main issue is the right of these people to live like Americans as they choose and to be accepted as good neighbors. What are you going to do about it? I intend to try to be a good neighbor. Do you feel that the Myers coming to Levittown will lead to large numbers of other Negroes coming here? I, I don't know. Do you think the Myers will be able to live here comfortably? I, I think it'll take a little time, but they will eventually. Have you heard any rumors about the Myers? Oh, dozens and dozens of rumors. What kind? Oh, that he was being paid by the... NAACP, that the Reds were behind it, that the Jews were behind it, that this group and that group was behind it. Uh, there were all kinds of rumors. I guess some of them were being spread deliberately, some were just a result of hysteria. Uh, there was all kinds of malicious rumors. There were, some of them were so ridiculous, you, would, you couldn't see how people could accept them, but in the atmosphere, some people did accept them and spread them. What course do you think the future of Levittown will take? Well, I'll tell you, I don't think Levittown's an island that's part of the USA, and I think it's going to integrate like the rest of this country's going to integrate. In Levittown, as elsewhere in America, there are those who believe that the rights and privileges of citizenship belong to all, regardless of their race or color or creed. And there are those who believe in equality, too, but in a somewhat more limited sense. In my business, whoever's got money and has good credit or wants to pay cash can buy a car. Uh, it has no discrimination, color, religion, or any type of that sort. Has the coming of the Myers affected your home life? Personally, my home life, it hasn't affected nothing whatsoever. But on the neighbors, they have a right. Because the average white person living in Levittown has four and five children. Well, let's put it this way. If the Levittown has migrated in hordes of Negroes, which they have a right to come here, but if something that happens that way, pretty soon my neighbor will be having a Negro son-in-law or a uh, daughter-in-law. How would that look? Wasn't Myers within his rights as a citizen to move wherever he pleased? Well, let's put it this way. Mr. Myers and all the Negroes have a uh, right. I'm no better than them. They're as good as I am. They can go anywhere they want. I mean, they have a uh, God-given rights, and, uh, and being a good American, they have the rights to the civil rights, they have the right to pursue their happiness. But by the same token, we have uh, mixed communities, and it's a proven fact that those mixed communities are over a third empty. He could have stayed there. He had a beautiful home there. The only reason that Mr. Myers came into Levittown is to show people they could get here. It wasn't that he wanted to come to Levittown, but my personal opinion is this. There is something bigger behind this. Is that your personal opinion only, or is it a fact? No, I say it's a fact. And I would tell anybody 
I mean, uh, barn nobody. I would tell them in a meeting, including uh, the gentleman at this, uh, the head of this uh, committee for bringing Mr. Myers here, I'd tell him. When did you first hear of Myers moving in? I heard uh, about Mr. Montana was having uh, coffee in a restaurant where he worked as a utility man, dishwasher, I don't know. It was supposed to be a part-time job, but I've seen him there at 7 in the morning till 9 at night. And then the paper says he was an engineer. Where did you hear it? That's where I heard it, from the waitresses in there. They asked me, did you see your new neighbors? And I didn't care to discuss it in public. What did you do? I didn't do anything. There you have it, an American community caught suddenly in a moment of crisis. Neighbors set against neighbor as they differ on what should be done about one Negro and his family who have come to share with them the American dream of a better way of life for their children. Many seem convinced that property values must decline when a community or a neighborhood becomes integrated. But studies which have been made prove the opposite to be true. Property values go up, provided there's no wave of panic selling. And even when there is panic, after the situation is stabilized, prices climb back and frequently go even higher than they were when the initial sale to a Negro was made. Does the integration of Negroes into a white community result in a higher rate of crime, violence, or juvenile delinquency? Not at all. Negroes living in predominantly white communities show a lower incidence of crime than the average for the general population. Is intermarriage the ultimate goal of Negroes in seeking to integrate into previously white communities? The studies show that of all the reasons Negroes have for seeking equality of opportunity, intermarriage is the least. And of all the fears that whites express, this is the greatest. Negroes seek only the right to buy or rent the kind of housing on the open market which they can afford. This basic principle of the free enterprise system, of which we're justly proud, is now denied to them in many communities. The exclusion of Negroes from white communities and their restriction to all Negro neighborhoods fixes negative ideas about them which are carried over from generation to generation. These false notions cause the abandonment by the white population of large areas within our great cities at a tremendous cost to the nation. Aided by a prosperous post-war economy, Negroes have held fast to their wartime gains and have sought to improve their lot in life. Advances against discrimination have been made in many fields. A new and much larger Negro middle class has grown up able, ambitious, and confident. These families are determined to leave the old, densely packed, segregated neighborhoods, and they're economically able to do it. They have the money to buy their way out of the slums. What happened in Levittown is merely the beginning of what is to follow in communities all over the country during the next few years, as Negroes, like all other Americans, get better education, better jobs, and accumulate more savings. Can we prepare our communities to receive these new neighbors in dignity and peace? Or will we wreck our communities with violence and abandon them in panic? This is the challenge posed for us as Levittowners sum it up for themselves. I don't think you can take a middle of the stand here. Either you're for them or against them. I've taken a stand for, for peace and nonviolence and no intimidation of the Myerses. I don't have any prejudice uh, against uh, colored. It's just that I wouldn't like to have one as a neighbor. We would act to them as we would act to any other neighbors. We would be friendly towards them and, and speak to them and visit with them. I wouldn't care to live in the community where the Negroes would be living. I think that the majority of people here will accept things and uh, believe, as I believe, that a good neighbor is not one whose color is white or black, just as a good citizen as such. Mr. Myers and all the Negroes have a right. I'm no better than them. They're as good as I am. But the only reason that Mr. Myers came into Levittown is to show people they could get here. I, I just feel that they're within their legal rights to move in here. And if they move in, they're law-abiding citizens. I have no complaints. 
if more colored are allowed to move in, Levittown is going to go downhill. I don't think that the Myers have anything to do with the property decreasing or increasing. I think it's purely a white problem, not a Negro problem. The main issue is the right of these people to live like Americans as they choose, to be accepted as good neighbors. For black folks living in the 50s, the landscape of America was a de facto segregation. Thurgood Marshall, a young attorney for the NAACP, argued in the Brown versus Board of Education, school segregation went against the 14th Amendment. And in May of 1954, the Supreme Court ruled school seg segregation unconstitutional. The victory gave many African Americans hope. And another achievement for the Civil Rights Movement was the Supreme Court decision that forced the Montgomery Bus Company to stop segregation in buses as a result of boycott arranged by this young man named Martin Luther King Jr. And in contrast, Malcolm X. Uh, I don't advocate any kind of hate. But there's a lot of talk that sounds very much like it. No, I think that the guilt complex of the American white man is so profound until when you begin to analyze the real condition of the black man in America, instead of the American white man eliminating the causes that create that condition, he tries to cover it up by accusing his accusers of teaching hate. But actually, they're just exposing him for being responsible for what exists. <clears throat> We've struggled all across the South in glorious struggles to get rid of legal, overt segregation and all of the humiliation that surrounded that system of segregation. In a sense, this was a struggle for decency. We could not go to a lunch counter in so many instances and get a hamburger or a cup of coffee. We could not make use of public accommodations. Public transportation was segregated. And often we had to sit in the back and within transportation, uh, transportation within cities, we often had to stand over empty seats because sections were reserved for whites only. We did not have the right to vote in so many areas of the South. And the struggle was to deal with these problems. Now certainly they were difficult problems, they were humiliating conditions. And by the thousands we protested these conditions. We made it clear that it was ultimately more honorable to accept jail cell experiences than to accept segregation and humiliation. By the thousand students and adults decided to sit in at segregated lunch counters to protest conditions there. When they were sitting at those lunch counters, they were in reality standing up for the best in the American dream seeking to take the whole nation back to those great wells of democracy which were dug deep by the founding fathers in the formulation of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Many things were gained as a result of these years of struggle. In 1964, the Civil Rights Bill came into being after the Birmingham movement, which did a great deal to subpoena the conscience of a large segment of the nation to appear before the judgment seat of morality on the whole question of civil rights. After the Selma movement in 1965, we were able to get a voting rights bill. Now, all of these things represented strides. But we must see that the struggle today is much more difficult. It's more difficult today because we are struggling now for genuine equality. And it's much easier to integrate a lunch counter than it is to guarantee a livable income and a good solid job. It's much easier to guarantee the right to vote 
than it is to guarantee the right to live in sanitary, decent housing conditions. It is much easier to integrate a public park than it is to make genuine quality integrated education a reality. And so today we are struggling for something which says we demand genuine equality. I'm sorry, but I don't want to be a, an emperor. That's not my business. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should like to help everyone if possible. Jew, Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone, and the good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful, but we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now, my voice is reaching millions throughout the world. Millions of despairing men, women, and children. Victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. To those who can hear me, I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed, the bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass and dictators die. And the power they took from the people will return to the people. And so long as men die, liberty will never perish. Soldiers, don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, and what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines. You are not cattle. You are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate. Only the unloved hate, the unloved and the unnatural. Soldiers, don't fight for slavery, fight for liberty. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke it is written, the kingdom of God is within man, not one man nor a group of men, but in all men, in you. You, the people, have the power. The power to create machines, the power to create happiness. You, the people, have the power to make this life free and beautiful, to make this life a wonderful adventure. Then in the name of democracy, let us use that power. Let us all unite. Let us fight for a new world, a decent world that will give men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie, they do not fulfill that promise, they never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now let us fight to fulfill that promise. Let us fight to free the world, to do away with national barriers, to do away with greed, with hate and intolerance. Let us fight for a world of reason. A world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite! Honoring those who made the sacrifice. Those who died. Those whose bones lie deep in the Atlantic Ocean. Those ancestors stolen from the motherland and taken to another land. We honor you, I say, I say. We honor those freedom fighters like Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey, Martin Luther King, Harriet Tubman, Mary Bethune, Nat Turner, and the thousands of others who fought, who bled, who died. I say, I say, we honor those, the unknown warriors, whose names we don't know, who fought, who bled and died for freedom. As we pour and we say, 
I say, I say, we honor the unborn children who will continue the legacy of sacrifice, who will fight in honor of those who fought the fight. I say, I say, we call out to those, join the fight. Join the fight and continue to honor those who fought, who bled, and who died. I say, I say. We pour libations and honor those who fought the fight. Get up, stand up, get up, stand up, stay in the fight, fight with all your might, take the time to honor those who fought the fight, Marcus, Malcolm, Martin, Harry, Bethune, Turner, I say, I say, get up, stand up, I say. Oh.